Okay. It's okay, but it's okay. It is uh, my real pleasure uh, uh, and thank to, to Professor Hussain for inviting me to participate in this session as a co-chair. It's really an honor to be uh, part of this uh, uh, work, uh, particularly being uh, in, the, in the presence of such a distinguished speaker uh, like uh, Professor uh, uh, Hassan Ibrahim. Uh, Professor Ibrahim is known to us. Yeah, he has been with us uh, before, but I'd, I'd like to introduce him as a, a, a person of great achievement. He had. Uh, he is currently the chief of nephrology and director of the Living Donor Kidney Transplant Program at the Houston Methodist. He had finished medical training in Detroit earlier on, and joined the University of Minnesota as a clinical fellow in nephrology. He obtained his master's degree in clinical research and eventually became a full professor in the University of Minnesota, director of the Division of Renal Disease and Hypertension, and medical director of the Kidney Transplant Program. Uh, professor uh, Ibrahim uh, has many research interests, mostly uh, in, in kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, kidney transplantation, uh, and he has a lot of work on the outcomes of kidney donors for which uh, he deserves his position today. Professor Ibrahim is going to talk to us about a rather unusual topic, uh, which is uh, CKC progression, CKD progression. Uh, what you drink and breathe might be important. I'm really very eager, Professor Hassan, to see what to breathe and what to eat in order to preserve my kidney function. It's you're welcome, sir. If you allow me, Professor Rashad, if you allow, allow me, I just have two minutes to introduce as well Professor Hassan Ibrahim. Uh, because as Professor Bersou mentioned, uh, Professor Hassan Ibrahim is a uh, well distinguished uh, researcher and a clinician, and this is his uh, uh, the research profile in Scobus, uh, HNDIC 33, uh, 105 documents, 4,071 citation. It is a great achievement uh, for medicine. I admire this article because it's one of the landmark articles in live donor kidney transplantation, documenting safety of long-term consequences of kidney donation in comparison to the normal population. So congratulations for the New England publication because this is a real achievement. And the second uh, article, he has a lot of publication, but I like this article too because we changed it our practice at Urology and Nephrology Center, Mansoura University, toward rapid discontinuation of steroid whenever immunological risk allow. Based one of the references in this article, 15 years after rapid discontinuation of prednisolone was fine associated with lower metabolic profile. And lastly, this is one of his very recent publications uh, documented that cold ischemia time is bad. Uh, and is associated with delayed graft, fu graft function. And this is the, the cohort of patient, more than 90,000 cadaveric kidney transplantation. <laughs> professor Hassan Ibrahim, as Professor Barsou mentioned, he, we are honored uh, to have him this year. I enjoyed attending five presentations, two presentations within the transplantation chapter led by Professor Ayman Rifai. These are the two topics, uh, overweight and obesity and the outcome of donation, and the three talks within the main Congress of Egyptian South of Norwegian transplantation about ACE inhibitors, uh, revisiting diabetic kidney disease, and the most exciting presentation that creates a lot of uh, discussions, which is uh, his talk about salt and water intake in health and CKD. And these are within, from the videos of his presentation through the chapter and through the Congress. The moderator, this is a real challenge for me today because we have a brilliant speaker and the great father of nephrology in Egypt. He is a symbolic of nephrology, medicine, and everything because he's a professor, philosopher, uh, physicians, or in, uh, Professor Barsoom is a real role model for all of us. And we, when we have uh, Professor Barsoom 
at your own and free center and everywhere we are glad and happy to have him with us and this is the, just to uh, i bought this photo because uh, professor samir sali professor amir fa and me were honored to have this photo with professor bersum also i would like to acknowledge professor amir fa for helping me to establish this the session today Uh, Professor Barsoom, uh, we enjoy and learn from his style of presentations many, many times. I, I, I like his style of education and the teaching, and uh, he is one of the uh, role models for us. And this is the last presentation in the last May uh, about COVID and the kidney. Uh, this enrich our SNP Virtual Academy. The Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Virtual Academy is proud. This is what we harvest through eight years, from 2012 up to this up to date. 4,627 lectures, 1,871 videos, a lot of videos for prestigious speakers, and we have 28,000 users from all over the world. During the COVID era, we have 132 Zoom meetings. And we have uh, uh, from Egypt, from the Arab world, and from uh, regional meetings, re regional uh, countries, and international speakers. Today we have Professor Hassan Ibrahim from the United States. Um, before I'm leaving the mic to Professor Hassan Ibrahim, I would like to declare that all ASNT, CME, and distance learning meetings are free from any industrial promotions, uh, so we have nothing to declare. It is my pleasure and honor to have two eminent figures uh, all over the world, uh, Professor Barsoom, the director and the, the uh, uh, president of this uh, meeting, and uh, the Professor Hassan Ibrahim, director, Division of Kidney Diseases and Transplantation Hostel, Methodist Hospital, United States, And uh, as uh, Professor Barsoom just mentioned, the title is very exciting. CKD progression, what you drink and the breathe might be important. I'm sure that the presentation will be fantastic and uh, we will take the opportunity of presence of Professor Barsoom to have a uh, spicy and hot discussion. Uh, so I'm going to stop here and uh, welcoming uh, Professor Hassan. Uh, please, you can start, share your slides. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to be with such great colleagues and friends. And, uh, and you always uh, have been a great host for me when I come to Egypt. And uh, I certainly wish this was in person so I could uh, get to visit with you. But again, I'm, uh, I'm truly honored uh, by your kind words and uh, by this invitation. Uh, I think what we've witnessed in the last 20 years is the following, uh, that this is what we used to see. If you remember 20 years ago when someone had a GFR of 40 or 50, within seven years, particularly type 2 diabetics, they reached to end stage uh, kidney disease. And I think we made some progress. I think the biggest progress probably was from the CAPTOPOL trial in 1993 in type 1 diabetic nephropathy. And since then, there's been, as you're well aware, many of these. And I think this was what we're seeing. And collectively, most people seem to think with uh, better blood pressure control, with ACE inhibitions, A2 blockers, uh, we have made or lengthened the time uh, to end stage kidney disease. So this has been really uh, an exciting uh, two decades uh, in nephrology. Now, I think despite this uh, improvement, uh, I think this is what we're seeing though. The number of cases of end-stage kidney disease uh, continues to rise. This is somewhat of an older slide, but uh, there's some suggestion that incident end-stage renal disease uh, is flat or not going uh, uh, up as high. Well, certainly you could think about this in one of three ways. One, 
Uh, what we have done is truly remarkable and we're able to stop the progression of kidney disease. Uh, or two uh, is that, which I suspect is true in many uh, places and the US is that many people are not choosing dialysis as a treatment for kidney failure and they would like just not to have any form. So I, I suspect a lot of people are not captured in incident ESRD because they're making a conscious choice not to have end-stage renal disease. Nevertheless, if, if this flattening is true, uh, that means uh, ACE inhibition, ARBs, uh, blood pressure control, and everything else we do is not sufficient to really uh, prevent end-stage kidney disease. So there has to be other factors that are really important. So what I thought I'd do, because this is emerging literature, maybe we need to start looking at other things uh, that might be contributing uh, to progression of kidney disease. So I'm going to discuss uh, the water intake and states of health briefly, uh, the impact it may have in chronic kidney disease, uh, spend a couple of minutes on state uh, on salt and state of health, but more importantly, show you some uh, recent data on salt and chronic kidney disease. But I think the topics that really have not received as much attention is sugar and CKD, uh, diet soda and CKD, coffee and CKD. I think this is such an important topic for me. I think it's it really, there's something there that needs to be explored. And lastly, talk about air pollution uh, and CKD. So why do people drink so much water? Uh, and now this is in the context of uh, no kidney disease. Well, there has been this common notion that people should drink uh, eight by eight. This is uh, eight ounces of water eight times a day. And this comes up to 1,600 mLs of water. Now, if you were to add the water you take from food, coffee, et cetera, if you were to follow this approach, that means you will uh, be taking three liters of liquid a day. So where did this recommendation come from? It really is amazing how uh, this is a deep conviction, especially in the West, that you should drink so much water. Uh, so where did it come from? Actually, nobody knows. And the most we know is, believe it or not, this comes from Jane Brody, who is, uh, she writes for the New York Times uh, on Tuesdays, which is the health section. And she actually suggested this 20 years ago. And the people who took advantage of this, believe it or not, is the companies that make water bottles. And they started making millions and millions of dollars. Uh, two years ago, Jane Brody actually apologized for this and uh, found out or figured out that what she recommended was not based on science. But I think it's too late. People are doing it. So why are they doing it? Well, uh, this is a common Western theme is that water flushes your system. What does that mean? Kind of removes your toxins. Uh, interestingly, if you uh, water load uh, people acutely, it actually reduces GFR. Uh, in contrast to, you know, if you give somebody saline or, you know, some uh, balanced solution, GFR goes up, but pure water acutely in fact, reduces GFR. Now, what if you give water in two, three liters a day for six months? Uh, studies have been done, they actually don't change GFR. So, but it does increase sodium and urea clearance uh, by inhibiting reabsorption, uh, but these are not toxins. Urea is not a toxin uh, and neither is salt. So this notion that it flushes your system is really not founded uh, neither acutely nor chronically. Uh, the other thing that people uh, drink water for is that they think it may make you eat less and therefore you could lose weight. Uh, and it certainly, uh, it seems like if you drink a lot of water with meals, it does reduce your caloric intake by 10%. But by the end of the day, you actually catch up with your caloric intake uh, it may reduce caloric balance by increasing energy use. Uh, you know, the more you drink, you have to kind of dispose of this water. It may increase your energy use, but at the end of the day, 
the studies are not uniform, that this is a helpful approach uh, in losing weight. Uh, I think a common theme uh, about drinking water, particularly in uh, women, is that drinking water improves the way your skin looks. Uh, and again, there's absolutely no evidence this is true. Uh, there is been, there's been one study in 12 uh, females showing that if you ingest 500 ml of water and, and you look at capillary blood flow to the skin, it might, it might improve transiently, but it's not sustained. So water does not seem to make your skin look better. Uh, you know, I think all of us experience when somebody's ha having a headache, the first thing people would do is like, oh, let me get you some water. Well, it turns out this has actually been studied in the literature. If you look, there's been randomized controlled trials in migraine patients uh, comparing water intake versus uh, higher water intake to see if it reduces uh, the frequency of migraine episodes, and it turns out it's not helpful. So in states of health, it doesn't seem that there's any evidence to suggest there is any added potential benefit to drinking water beyond when you're thirsty. Drinking water when you're thirsty should be more than sufficient to maintain kidney function uh, and uh, other health uh, aspects. Now, in the setting of chronic kidney disease, uh, this is a, an observational study from a Canadian group. Uh, and what they wanted to look at is to look what urine volume uh, uh, what kind of impact it has on your progression of kidney disease. And urine volume here is taken as a surrogate for how much liquid uh, you drink. And the correlation, which is uh, interesting, the correlation between urine volume and what you drink is not perfect uh, because, you know, you have some water generation internally. So, but urine volume probably reflects 75, maybe 80% of your fluid intake. At any rate, this is a, a study uh, between 2002 and 2008. In total, there was 2,400 uh, patients and they had uh, multiple GFR measurements uh, up to seven years. So the question is, you have these 2,000 patients, you have multiple GFR measurements. Do people with higher urine volume, i.e., do people with higher fluid intake uh, have less likelihood of their kidney disease uh, progressing. Uh, what you see in this observational, people with one, less than one liter a day, over the seven year of the study, their kidney disease or the GFR declined by six mLs per minute, very rapid. And you go to the other extreme, if you drink more than three liters a day, the rate of decline in GFR was two mLs per minute. But again, this is an observational study and it doesn't control for many factors. It is possible people who drink more water are just generally healthier people. And maybe there are people who exercise a lot and their water intake uh, through exercise and being more fit is what's uh, causing this. So again, the only thing we could learn from observational data is that it should generate questions for future studies. And finally, this has been done. Uh, this is from Bill Clark uh, from Canada. Uh, this is a trial, I believe, in almost 10 Canadian centers uh, published in JAMA a couple of years ago. And let me take you through uh, the design of the study. Uh, these are uh, almost 2,400 patients with chronic kidney disease. And after some exclusion criteria, they ended up with 600 uh, patients. They were randomized to uh, drinking uh, two liters uh, of water or total liquid a day compared to three liters. Uh, again, to look to see if higher water intake is associated with a more favorable uh, impact on kidney function. And this is what these patients look like. Uh, they're the typical uh, chronic kidney disease population, mean age of uh, 64. The majority were Caucasian, BMI is 30. And prior to being in the trial, uh, the average person was taking two liters uh, of fluid a day. 
uh, hypertension and diabetes, kind of the most common causes in, 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 uh, of kidney disease in these two groups. Uh, this is important. Uh, half of the patients had a GFR less than 45 and 15% were macroalbuminuric. Uh, so the best way to remember this trial uh, is that 50% had GFR less than 50 and 50% uh, had um, um, microalbuminuria. This is the actual mean GFR in the two groups. It was 43 mLs per minute. So kind of stage three, uh, stage four chronic uh, kidney disease. Uh, of note, 70% uh, uh, of these patients wa were on ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So this is kind of how I view it is the typical patients you see in clinic with a GFR 40, 45, and an ACE inhibitor. And you're trying to find, is there anything else I could do to slow the progression of their kidney disease? And these are the results. You could see that pre-randomization, uh, people were drinking uh, 1.9 1, 1 uh, uh, liter in the um, hydration group, 1.9 liter in the control group. And you could see at 12 months in the third row, that the hydration group, the group that was instructed to drink uh, more generously, got to two and a half liters uh, versus two liters. And if you actually did it, this is really interesting. So the urine volume, when you measured it, was 2.5 liter. When you ask the patients what they were drinking, they tell you it's 2.8 liters, which is to my point earlier, is that some of this is water generation uh, internally and has nothing to do. So urine volume does not always equal uh, what you drink. Uh, so these, these again, uh, the result, uh, actually this is really interesting. So how do you know, uh, you know how much water to give? And I think they went about it in a, in a very smart way. Uh, they measured uh, copeptin level to, to make sure they're comparable between the groups. And to make sure that with higher water intake, copeptin uh, was reduced more. And as you know, this is kind of, uh, you could think of it as ADH if you want. So the lower copeptin level, that means the higher your hydration uh, status is. So I think, I thought that was very clever to substantiate uh, how much the person was drinking with a, a, a biochemical uh, test. Well, these are uh, the results. The hydration group, again, the control group started with GFR 43. At 12 months, uh, both group lost uh, two mLs uh, per minute of GFR. So uh, there appears to be no evidence that drinking more water uh, actually slows the progression of kidney disease, uh, at least in this Canadian population. And you may say, well, this trial is really uh, small, it didn't last long. Certainly there's no signal in it. Has there been a signal? I think they would have carried it uh, a little uh, longer. Now, before I move to, to SALT, I think uh, I have to uh, kind of do say there is no question that generous water intake has a very important place in uh, the current management of polycystic kidney disease as it inhibits cyclic AMP, which has been incriminated in cyst growth. I think that's very important. Uh, obviously, it's very important to be, have generous water intake uh, in nephrolithiasis uh, and kidney uh, stones. So I think polycystic kidney disease is actually a, a unique situation. One slide I didn't add in here, what is the impact of larger water intake, uh, say, on transplant patients? Uh, we published this paper a few years ago. We had uh, over 150 transplant patients followed for five years, and we measured their urine volume every three months. And actually, what we found, people with higher urine volume tended to have more interstitial fibrosis on their five-year biopsy compared to uh, their baseline biopsy. And if one, anyone is interested, uh, that paper is in clinical transplantation. Uh, I wish I had a slide for it. So I apply this knowledge to transplant recipients as well uh, to say, you know, just drink when you're thirsty. Certainly the first month after transplant, the kidney does not have uh, intact concentrating ability. So I do encourage them to drink. But after the first month, I think they should just drink when they're thirsty. 
How about salt? I think salt, we could think of it as in the context of uh, normal states and the context of chronic kidney disease because those are two uh, distinct uh, populations. I have to say, I personally don't think uh, the evidence is very uh, well supported to, uh, for salt restriction in general. Uh, I'll show you uh, a paper that reflects my own bias. I know people um, have different opinion on this, but I think this is probably one of the most important paper looking at fatal and non-fatal outcome. More importantly, uh, the incidence of hypertension in people who had no blood pressure issues uh, at baseline and correlate these outcomes with your salt. And this is a really uh, important uh, observational cohort study. It's called the Flemish study on genes, which has contributed immensely to our understanding of uh, genetic uh, di diabetes, et cetera. So in total, it has 3,681 patients and none of these patients were allowed into the study if they have cardiovascular disease. So no cardiovascular disease in anyone, and 2,000 out of the 3,000 have no hypertension, and they were followed for 7.9 years. And this is what you see. So this is looking at cardiovascular mortality on the left and uh, all cardiovascular events. And it really is striking. So a follow-up of 15 years, people who ingested uh, low salt actually were more likely to develop uh, cardiovascular disease. So you may wonder, well, why, why would that be? Well, I think, you know, you I, I think it's one of those things, you know, in the setting of chronic kidney disease, for example, we want the renin angiotensin system to be suppressed. Well, low salt, if anything, it's going to activate the renin angiotensin system. And that's in fact what has been uh, kind of uh, stated as one of the reasons you may have increased cardiac events with low salt intake, that it does aggravate or stimulate your renin angiotensin system. Now, this just looks at you know how low is low urine sodium. So this is looking at overall mortality and the left of your screen and cardiovascular events. And you could see when you get to 100 milli equivalent or millimole per day, you could see that there's double the mortality uh, with uh, low salt intake at 100. So, but look at uh, kind of typical salt intake, it's around 200, it, it's a significant difference. So this also brings the question, what is salt restriction? Is it 100, is it 50 millimoles or, and I think that answer is not known. But I think this, this really is striking that uh, lower urine sodium is associated with higher mortality. Certainly there seems to be maybe a sweet spot, maybe between you know, 100 to 150, where you're not at excess risk and you're not restricting uh, your sodium too much. What I think is a very important part of the study, if you remember, these are 3,000 people or 4,000 almost, and 2,000 of them had no hypertension at the beginning of the study. And you could see this is what is one's chances of developing hypertension based on these serial 24-hour urine sodium measurements. And you could see there was absolutely uh, no difference. So from this study, at least, I mean, you may argue that this population is not the same as, you know, an Egyptian population or an American population, which is a very valid point. But it doesn't seem to suggest that higher salt is associated with uh, more hypertension or uh, and higher salt is actually associated with less cardiac events. But certainly you could find other data to, uh, to prove the opposite. And I'm fully aware of this, but I, I somehow always favored this, uh, this sentiment about salt. You know, if you like Cochrane and what they do in terms of uh, collecting the evidence, this is uh, Cochrane Review, uh, they took uh, six randomized, uh, they took only randomized controlled trials that looked at low salt versus normal salt and had more than six months of follow-up adults and the outcome is mortality or cardiovascular morbidity. In total, there were seven studies and uh, 6,000 patients 
and half of them were normal tensive. So this is putting everything that's out there that was done properly, randomized, and with more than six months of follow-up. And there was absolutely no difference uh, in mortality, uh, whether you were on low salt or high salt. So low salt was not uh, protective uh, at all. So I think, you know, then you start thinking, well, is chronic kidney disease different? You know, these are people who are uh, volume expanded, they're salt sensitive, et cetera. Well, I don't know if we know the answer, but let me show you uh, this, this, this paper. I think it's one of the better uh, done ones. This is from Rajiv Saran at Michigan. And what they did, they took chronic kidney disease patients, not very large study, 29. One group goes on salt restricted diet. One group goes on usual diet. And if you started on the salt restricted diet, then you cross over to the usual. And if you started unusual, you cross over uh, to the uh, low salt. So this particular design, the crossover design, people use it because uh, you don't need as many patients. So if I, you know, if in a crossover design, you will need 80% less patients to answer the question if you were to do a parallel design. Of course, you know, uh, the problem with crossover designs is this washout period. How do you know that there was no carryover from what you were randomized to before to the next stage? But that's a topic for another time. And basically what they want to see is, does low salt affect uh, renal parameters? And sure enough, this is sodium intake. You know, they were taking around 150 at baseline. And if you want an SRD, which is salt restricted diet, you, your urine sodium went down, which makes sense. You only uh, expel in the urine what you eat. And the same in the other group uh, as well. So if, if you follow a low sodium diet, your sodium in the urine will go down. And, you know, they did uh, very cool stuff. They did, you know, bioimpedance uh, or bioelectrical impedance to measure total body water, extracellular volume and intracellular volume. Uh, and what they saw, you know, if you followed the low sodium diet, your total body water and extracellular volume decreased. There's nothing shocking there. I mean, everybody would have uh, expected that. So what are the clinical measurements they were interested in? Well, they found that if you followed uh, a salt-restricted diet, your blood pressure went down, uh, which is, uh, and, but this is the really interesting thing. Your blood pressure went down, but your weight uh, did go down a little bit, uh, but not as, uh, as much uh, would expect. But what they saw is, you know, you get an eight millimeter difference in systolic blood pressure, which is, you know, if you have hundreds and millions of patients with CKD, this might be a, a very uh, important. Now, you know, before we leave this, uh, I think it's really important to, to think about, uh, you know, what are the implications of low salt in chronic kidney disease? So this suggests it's better for you, uh, blood pressure. But you have to remember, there's never ever been a study that showed low salt in chronic kidney disease is associated with uh, hard or the improvement in hard clinical endpoints, such as reduction of uh, end-stage renal disease or doubling of creatinine. So everything that's been done in chronic kidney disease shows your blood pressure might improve there are small studies, your proteinuria might improve. Uh, and the improvement in proteinuria with low salt might be directly related to blood pressure rather than specific. While I think it, it's an approach that's excellent in many chronic kidney disease patients, but I don't think we have the data to say it can definitively reduce end-stage renal disease uh, or progression, but it certainly has a place and some people in whom uh, blood pressure cannot be controlled. My concern about salt restriction in chronic kidney disease is that our patients, you know, their appetite declines as GFR declines, their caloric intake declines. And if we add to it, and remember their ability to taste salt and sweet and sour is actually reduced. Uh, so if you restrict salt to a great degree, 
I, I worry that we may be depriving them or promoting their uh, malnutrition, which as you know, is very common by the time they get to end stage kidney disease. So I worry about that. And uh, I think if you were to follow low salt, I think more careful measurement of serum albumin uh, to make sure they're not wasting away is important. How about sugar and soda? Uh, my two favorite things, but... Uh, so there has been a lot of discussions about how uh, sugars could actually be associated with chronic kidney disease. Uh, and these are all just, uh, you know, concepts that some of them are based on, on data and some of them are not. And I'll show you what I kind of could find out about these is that, you know, most people think dietary sugar uh, is, you know, leads to diabetes, while well, diabetes leads to chronic kidney disease. Sugars lead to obesity. Obesity uh, leads to hypertension, hyperfiltration, uh, and that leads to chronic kidney disease. And the other thing which is emerging, uh, interestingly now, is that dietary sugars actually uh, directly increase uric acid. And uric acid, as you know, uh, have been incriminated in hypertension, certainly with stones. So you could see uh, the dietary sugar, the way people are thinking about it uh, as if it's not toxic in itself, but it's what it leads to. So you could you know, think, remove the box that say, says dietary sugar and just put high calories and you could you know, have the same diagram. But now it appears that it's beyond the calorie part of the sugar that's causing this. So let me show you some of this data um, so, uh, fructose for certain, uh, you know, the sucrose, glucose, and fructose. The fructose is the one that's really been uh, kind of linked the most to kidney disease. It certainly increases uric acid. And as we said, uric acid can increase blood pressure, uh, stones, and chronic kidney disease. I don't know how many of you have followed the, you know, the, that uric acid is important. Certainly, Richard Johnson have always promoted this idea that uric acid is bad for, you know, hypertension, chronic kidney disease. Uh, but I think this, this question, I think, is now a little bit, bit answered, at least in type 1 diabetic. Uh, this is a paper from my old institution, the University of Minnesota, that just got published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at type 1 diabetics with microalbuminuria who are randomized to alpurinol versus placebo to see if it alters their GFR or albuminuria, and there was absolutely no benefit. Again, you could argue maybe uh, uric acid is more important in type two diabetics or other diseases, and certainly that's a possibility. But from my take on uric acid, I think it does not seem to be a major uh, contributor to kidney disease. So again, fructose but not dextrose accelerates uh, chronic kidney disease in animals. And in fact, you know, there's fructose uh, models uh, where you, uh, and if you do histology of these kidneys, you'll actually see the classic telltale signs of hyperfiltration, larger kidneys, glomerular hypertension. And there are distinct changes uh, of, uh, in the preglomerular vessels, which is highly reminiscent of what you see in diabetic glomerulosclerosis. Now, that was the animal stuff. How about epidemiological stuff? Uh, there's been really some cool studies where uh, patients or healthy volunteers were actually randomized to glucose versus fructose sweetened beverages for 10 weeks. Uh, you gain, obviously, it's the same caloric uh, yield from glucose versus fructose. So for 10 weeks, the participants in the study, whether they were taking glucose-based or fructose, they gained a similar weight. But if you look at the group that took the fructose, most of the weight gain was central uh, fat, which is, as you know, that's the type of fat that is um, associated with higher insulin level uh, and plasma lipids. And that also has been to be true with sucrose. So sucrose versus artificial sweet sweeteners have uh, been associated with higher plasma and lipid and insulin levels. Now, it, there's been some kind of retrospective data that if you reduce dietary sugar sweetened beverages, 
you could actually lower uh, blood uh, uh, pressure. I think the most dramatic that I've seen is that uh, if one drinks five sh sugary soft drinks a week, uh, they're associated with a 30% higher risk of blood pressure more than 140. Uh, even more striking, uh, some data showing that diet soda drinkers have 167% uh, higher risk of diabetes. Now, we'll talk about what could be the potential mechanism. And again, none of these are large randomized trials to really answer the question, but certainly makes us think about uh, these issues. So what, are, what is the actual data? Well, there's been only uh, five cross-sectional and prospective uh, data, and the outcomes of interest were albuminuria, GFR decline, or self-reported diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. Uh, I apologize if this slide doesn't uh, show well, but I could tell you in total, these five observational uh, studies have close to uh, 50,000 participants in it. And the exposure have been whether you drank uh, more than one uh, 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 soda a day or cola, if you want to call it, anywhere from one to seven. And again, the outcomes are self-diagnosed kidney disease, uh, gender-specific albuminuria, GFR less than 60, or GFR uh, more than 30% decline. And you could see the hazard ratio in the column before last, uh, 2.51, 1.4, 1.4. .4. So in three, two of these studies, uh, the risk of incidence CKD or albuminuria uh, were actually elevated, but in the three other studies, it was not. So some studies suggest that sugary drinks actually are associated with incidence CKD others have not. And some of them are larger in size uh, than others, uh, but collectively there might be a suggestion there, uh, obviously far from definitive. This is looking at uh, people who drink more than two uh, diet uh, colas uh, per day. Again, you could see the number a thousand people, 9,000 people. Uh, and 33. I think the last one is kind of my favorite one because it has 3,000 patients and it's prospective rather than cross-sectional. Because when you do a cross-sectional study, you're basically asking people, well, how many you know, beverages do you drink? And people have recall bias, et cetera. With a prospective cohort study where this is actually part of the survey questions they get on routine basis, I think you have less recall bias. At any rate, in these 3,300 patients, the exposure drinking more than two diet uh, beverages a day. And the end point was GFR declined by more than 30%. Uh, the relative risk was 2.02. So you're 100% more likely or twice more likely uh, to develop uh, uh, worse GFR if you drank two colas. By the way, if you're interested, I mean, this is age-adjusted calorie intake, hypertension, BMI, diabetes, uh, smoking activity, and cardiovascular disease. What you notice that it's not adjusted for uh, is albuminuria. So th it is possible this is residual confounding from not taking into account uh, albuminuria. Uh, this is uh, from the Boston group uh, looking specifically at women and declining kidney function and albuminuria with soft drinks. Why did they uh, pick to study women? There really is no reason to think women behave differently when it comes to diet soda. But I think they, the reason is because we have this famous uh, nurses health study, which has been around for the last 50 years. Uh, and these are nurses who uh, are contacted every two years and they're asked a lot of questions. So we have a lot of data on them. So it just created a unique opportunity for them to look at it. Uh, and the outcome is albuminuria or GFR more than, decline more than 30% over 15, 11 years. So the exposure is how much soda or artificial soda you drink and the development of proteinuria or a reduction in GFR over 11 years. 
Uh, and this, I'm um, sorry, I don't have a slide on it. And actually what it showed is that women, uh, I apologize, women actually were more likely to uh, develop uh, albuminuria, at least nurses are, uh, if they drank more than two uh, diet drinks. So I, I think this is a clinical summary that I took out from advances in chronic disease that sugar consumption is associated with rising prevalence of CKD in the United States. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if it's the same in other countries. Uh, the mechanisms, as I showed you, particularly fructose, uh, it's increased uric acid, of course, diabetes, obesity, obesity and hypertension, which are, I don't think they're specific to these agents. Uh, but again, remember, a lot of the studies were accounted or adjusted for caloric intake, so it might be specific to them. And I showed you the five studies that uh, showed uh, kind of mixed uh, methodology and inconsistent findings, but the larger one, at least the prospective one, do, do suggest that there might be a relationship. Uh, I think this is probably one of the better studies done. Uh, this is specifically looking at diet soda. Uh, and this is from the atherosclerosis risk in community study, which uh, is a study that began in uh, 1996. And it has 16,000 people in it from four different counties in the US who are followed prospectively. So this follow up 23 years. And to date, or as of last year, two years ago, there was 357 end stage kidney disease. And again, the same question, how much diet soda you drink? And now in this case, this is why this is an important study it's not looking at intermediate outcomes such as proteinuria or uh, hypertension or reduction in GFR. It's looking at end-stage kidney disease. Uh, interestingly, half of the population really drinks less than uh, one diet Coke uh, a week, but uh, I, was, I was struck by the fact that 13% of the population drinks more than seven a week. This is really inter this this study. If you're not familiar with it, it really is highly representative of the U.S. population in terms of ethnicity, gender, and it's very careful. It has urine, albumin, it has cystatin C. It has everything you would want to adjust for, and this is what it showed. This is your odds ratio. Again, remember the follow-up was over 23 years, and you could see people who. Uh, drank more than seven drinks per week were 83% more likely to develop end-stage kidney disease. It doesn't look like the people who drank between one and four have higher risk. So this, is, I think, is an important, important study because of the length of follow-up, the large number of participants, but more importantly, it doesn't have the issue of residual confounding that uh, we discussed with the other studies. Is there a special group that's more affected by this? There really isn't female, male, black, white, whether you're diabetic, uh, obese, overweight. Uh, it really didn't matter who, you know, in all these groups listed on this slide, higher salt, higher soda intake uh, tra translated into more ESRD, maybe with the exception of uh, people did not have diabetes and who are normal in weight. Uh, which is not many people. Uh, again, this just shows you the risk of end-stage renal disease and in groups, female, anything right of this line is significant. So it was true in female and male, black and white. It was very true in diabetics, but not as true in no diabetes and certainly true in people with overweight. So with the exception of people with normal weight, and no diabetes, everybody else, everybody was at higher risk for incident uh, and stage renal disease. So since this paper came out uh, three, four years ago, this has now been a routine question that I added to evaluating patients with chronic kidney disease, similar to how I ask about, you know, how long have you had diabetes? What the level of control is? How long have you had hypertension? It really has become an important question uh, that I added uh, to my evaluation of patients. So why is sodas bad? Well, it might be the sugar part, like we, we talked about it. Uh, but I think the interesting notion, which is, I think it's probably more true, well, soda contains a lot of phosphorus. 
phosphorus turns on your uh, FGF23. And as you know, FGF23 has been linked to CKD or even heart failure and mortality. So is that possibly the mechanism? Uh, well, they don't have phosphorus intake in that study, so that might uh, would have been nice. Phosphorus also increases dietary acid load. And as you know, uh, there's a lot of interest now whether treating acidosis actually slows the progression of kidney disease. I think the second point is, which I think is probably extremely relevant, is that maybe diet soda is a proxy for poor diet. You know, someone who watches their diet and eats healthy is less likely to drink diet soda with their meals. So maybe it's not as much the diet soda, but it, the diet soda in itself is reflecting kind of poor dietary habits. And, you know, again, without a randomized trial, which nobody will ever do, uh, we will not know the answer to that. And certainly uh, there's been some animal data that uh, soda actually uh, can induce the metabolic uh, syndrome. How about coffee? Uh, these are some interesting facts about coffee. The annual production of coffee worldwide is about 8 million uh, tons. Uh, every day, uh, 2.3 billion cups of coffee are drank. And as we go through the remainder of the talk, I'd like you to think about coffee as two things. As the caffeine part, which remember you could get it from tea, you could get it from diet soda. Uh, and there's the chlorogenic acids uh, that are really the uh, important part of the coffee. So two components, caffeine and the chlorogenic acid. Uh, I'd like to show you some data on roasting coffee because you know, if you go to Starbucks, they asked you, well, you know, you want a coffee? Said, so, yeah, light roast or medium roast or dark roast. I'd like to show you how important this, you know, uh, when you next time you go to Starbucks, hopefully will help you make a, the best healthy choice. Uh, but light roast uh, is, uh, can, can be antioxidant uh, benefit. So this is uh, a paper that looked at uh, coffee consumption and incident kidney disease. Uh, I just told you about the ERIC study, which is the 16,000 uh, people who will represent the kind of general US population who've been followed since 1996. And again, the question is how much coffee you drink and what impact does that have on your kidney disease? Or end stage kidney disease. Actually, in this study, it's, there were 14,000 patients who had data on coffee and they had outcome data, which is uh, incident CKD, GFR less than 60, or more than a 25% decrement from uh, your baseline. And again, what I like about the study is the large number and the follow-up uh, of 24 years. So what did the study show? Well, anything left of the line actually shows uh, reduction in end-stage renal disease with coffee consumption. So you can see the top panel overall, there was a 12% reduction in end-stage kidney disease in coffee drinkers. This is really interesting. It was more true in women than men. And this reminds me of a, a great paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from seven years ago which actually showed that women who drink uh, uh, coffee are less likely to develop type two diabetes. And it made me wonder whether it's the same, but coffee does seem to be more protective in women than uh, men. Now, you know, the impact, you know, coffee and smoking, this is an important uh, part of this study. You know, you wanna see, I mean, certainly smokers tend to drink more coffee uh, and coffee sometimes triggers the urge to smoke. So you wanna tease this out. And you know, it, there really wasn't uh, a difference unless you are a former smoker, you are actually less likely to develop kidney disease. Uh, so no, di no diabetes were uh, equally protected, if you may. Uh, whites were more protected, blacks were not. So the summary of this is that uh, overall, coffee consumption seems to be associated with less end-stage kidney disease, particularly in women 
particularly in people who have no diabetes and uh, in whites. Now, is it so, I, is it the coffee or is it something else that actually in the coffee uh, that uh, conveys this benefit? And this is uh, uh, Quan Lan, who has done a lot about in, in renal nutrition. He's been, uh, she's been really impressive in this area. And let me show you what they did. So they have the Singapore Chinese Health Study, which is really uh, a gold mine of data for people who are interested in uh, health uh, outcome research. Uh, 63,000 people, it's huge. Follow-up of 16.8 years. And they asked a simple question. Is it the coffee or is it caffeinated beverages? Well, the way you would go about this is to ask people what they're drinking. And uh, I truly apologize, I didn't, make I didn't have time to redo this slide. So if you look at the intake on the left, it has coffee, one cup, more than two cups, et cetera, black tea, green tea, and soda. And you know, the average content of caffeine in these drinks are actually uh, pretty similar. And uh, it turns out people who drank soda or green tea or black tea, uh, again, all of these have caffeine, were not protected or was not a so higher intake of these, of caffeine from these three beverages was not associated uh, with less uh, end stage kidney disease. But if you look at model four uh, on the right, people who drank uh, more coffee uh, actually uh, have uh, less end-stage ki kidney disease. So this is the first study to actually show it's not the caffeine part of the beverage that actually conveys this benefit. Uh, it's something else other than caffeine. Since tea does not do it, the caffeine in soda does not do it, the caffeine in green tea does not do it uh, either. Uh, and this is again, looking at ca caffeine intake, which is uh, again, this is very unique to the study where they actually looked at caffeine intake uh, and you could see caffeine, higher caffeine intake was not associated with less and, uh, kidney disease. So the potential benefit of coffee really has nothing to do uh, with uh, caffeine. So what is it? Well, you know, it, 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 it's these, uh, what I showed you, a lot of the benefit of, uh, from coffee actually comes from uh, the chlorogenic acid. And these have very an, important antioxidant and cytotoxic benefits. This is one paper looking at myoblast. But it turns out the key to the benefit of coffee uh, so we talked earlier about going to Starbucks. So if you get light roast versus medium roast versus dark roast, the medium roast coffee and the dark roast coffee actually takes away the benefit of these chlorogenic acid. And only light roast coffee is the one that's associated with antioxidant uh, benefit. So that's something for you to think about when you order your next uh, latte or coffee. Light roast is the only way to go if you're looking for the uh, antioxidant uh, benefit. So how does it all uh, play out? How do these chlorogenic acids uh, work? This is uh, uh, from the European Journal of uh, Nutrition. And it seems to me, you know, these chlorogenic acid, they mainly have been positioned to play a lot of antioxidant activity, a lot of anti-inflammatory activity, uh, but I have to say, I'm more impressed by how much they do uh, in regulation of glucose metabolism with all the uh, good benefit that comes uh, with um, improved metabolic profile and cardio protection. But if you're really interested in, in these chlorogenic acids, I encourage you to, this is a beautiful review in uh, EGN uh, from 2017, but it really opened my eyes about you know, uh, coffee. So now I use that in my practice, you know, in asking about soda, ask them to avoid them. Uh, and I actually say, well, if you like coffee, maybe you want to replace your soda with coffee as long as it's light roasted. Uh, 
uh, which to a lot of patients seem uh, entertaining that they never think about coffee in the kidney. They think about caffeine in the kidney, but they don't think about coffee in the kidney. So I want to and uh, think about how about you know we talked about water, salt, coffee, and soda. Uh, and how about the air we breathe? Is there really a reason to worry about this? And remember, the reason we're discussing all these because we're seeing a plateau despite everything we do in kidney disease, we're not seeing more decline in kidney function. If anything, it's going up. So we need to start thinking about what additional factors might be at play. Well, why would you, what is, what is the issue with air pollution and disease? Well, it's certainly, uh, it's no surprise to anyone. It's actually been associated uh, with increased uh, risk of death, stroke, and CVD. Uh, there's a really interesting paper from, you know, if you look at the mortality in coal miners uh, in Virginia, uh, kind of the Eastern coast of the US, it's actually uh, much higher than the other professions. One of the really interesting papers that, uh, that came out of Boston looking at a thousand patients who were hospitalized for stroke and looking at their GFR. And at least in that population, if you live close to a major road or highway, you tended to have a much lower GFR after accounting for uh, other factors. So living in, I've seen some evidence, people who live next to a major bus station or a major train station may indeed have a lower GFR after accounting for uh, multiple factors. Obviously the issue with that, and we could talk about that for a long time. Well, if you live next to a train station or a bus station or the highway, uh, you probably are of a different socioeconomic status than someone who lives you know, far away from traffic. So that issue is still not resolved. But how, how can air pollution actually uh, affect kidney function? I, I don't think we know. I think, you know, people invoke disturbances in renal hemodynamics. There's actually, if you expose uh, renal tissues and cell culture to certain uh, pollutants, they actually, it does increase uh, renal damage. And if you study animal models of different types, and if you just expose, expose them to different uh, uh, pollution levels, it may make the underlying model progress. So what is the evidence in human? Well, this is a really interesting <clears throat> uh, paper. So in the United States is the Environmental Protection Agency, which is in charge of making sure the environment is safe, et cetera. And it certainly has been uh, an important organization till President Trump really ruined it by taking away a lot of the regulation that were making the air safe by just giving people a license to do whatever they want. It has been really uh, disturbing. But anyway, if you take data from the EPA, which collects information on uh, air pollution in the US and link it to healthcare system to see who developed uh, incident uh, uh, ESRD or uh, worsening in uh, kidney function. And if you do this, there was uh, almost two and a half million people who were involved uh, in this uh, data. Uh, let me show you uh, what it showed. Uh, again, if it doesn't project each line is a higher level uh, of uh, pollution, uh, looking at survival. And the more pollution uh, there was in certain areas, uh, people were more likely uh, to die. Uh, this is looking at the incident uh, and, and state. You could see there's uh, four columns, e EGFR less than 60, incident CKD, or more than 30% decline in EGFR or ESRD. And whether you looked at uh, just as at the year 2000 and you looked at an annual level, uh, there was an association. Uh, you could, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, so the bottom right uh, box under ESRD, uh, if you got exposed to higher level of pollution, you're 31% more likely uh, to develop incident uh, ESRD uh, regardless of other factors. And this was accounted for or adjusted for age, sex, cancer, CVD, diabetes, hypertension, BMI, smoking, 
whether you're taking an ACE or ARB um, and so on and so forth. So it was pretty well done. And there's very little doubt that air pollution seemed to uh, be associated with end-stage kidney disease. Whether it's causal or not, obviously, this data does not uh, answer that question. Uh, again, this is just looking, uh, again, at the same thing, the hazard ratios. And again, the upshot of it, the higher pollution rates are more likely to uh, be associated with a 30% higher chance. Uh, this is, shows you how bad the problem is. And the more red or the red areas uh, are where most of the pollution is. And, you know, it's the East Coast uh, and the South. Uh, this is where most of the mines are. You could see if you live in the north of the U.S. how uh, is yeah, very little pollution as, as you go north. And it makes you wonder whether some of the clustering of kidney disease uh, is related. Now, since we know what contributes to kidney disease, the diabetes and the hypertension, and we know the rates in these cities, we could actually, how many cases per 100,000 are attributable to pollution a year. In the, in the clean areas, only maybe, uh, say, 50 cases uh, per 100,000 are attributed to uh, pollution. In the red areas, it's as high as 300 cases. Think about this. 300 cases out of 100,000 are attributed to uh, pollution. I'm really, really interested to see what this data would look like uh, in the current pandemic, as people in the last few months have driven less, uh, actually the air quality in the U.S. has improved by 20% during the lockdown, and it would be interesting to see whether that has an impact or not. Uh, the last is illicit drugs. This is, again, uh, patients ask about that, you know, uh, and I know it's not as uh, much of an issue uh, outside the U.S. maybe, uh, marijuana use and chronic kidney disease. There's been studies that looked at uh, GFR in people who use marijuana or have used it more than five years. Uh, and it, it turns out marijuana users have a lower GFR, but it, they actually, their GFR over time is not different. Uh, so there appears to be no impact of marijuana and uh, GFR. In contrast, uh, cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, this is from the Chronic Renal Insufficiency Cohort Study, which is an NIH study, uh, they have 25% higher risk of ESRD if they have established CKD and obviously higher mortality. So there's no, and I think this has uh, implications also on, you know, why we're so picky about kidney transplant recipients who are taking these drugs as you know, a lot of them have vasoconstrictive effect, uh, rhabdo, et cetera. Uh, but uh, they are, the, these associations are serious in, in this way. Smoking, I think it's a topic uh, for, uh, for a whole day. Uh, it, 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 the evidence is mixed. You know, data from the US doesn't show that uh, smoking was associated with CKD progression. But there's a recent meta-analysis from a Chinese group showing that it does convey higher risk of CKD and ESRD. So I think for the individual patient, the answer is obvious. Uh, you know, this stuff is going to kill you. Uh, you need to stop it. And it may potentially have a benefit on slowing the progression of kidney disease. You know, there's been animal studies. How could that be? You know, nicotine uh, uh, injection actually does raise intraglomerular pressure if you believe in hyperfiltration. Uh, so I think there is biological possibility beyond the vasoconstriction. So I think in summary, I think uh, more water is not better in health or CKD. Uh, low salt diet may reduce intermediate renal outcomes, but we don't have supporting data to say it reduces end-stage kidney disease. Fructose and diet soda diet has been linked to CKD, and I think uh, in my mind, it should be a strong recommendation to avoid these or be extremely moderate on them. I think smoking and illicit drugs, except marijuana, have been linked to CKD, and they've been should be strongly encouraged to force uh, abstinence and helping people through uh, programs that would help them achieve this. 
I, I, I have to say I, I'm more and more impressed by the contribution of air pollution to, uh, to chronic kidney disease. And I think we need to be more cognizant uh, of this. One way to kind of look at this, it'd be really interesting to look at countries uh, where they have uh, more public transport, transportation, where people don't drive their own cars everywhere they go and to look to see if there's a difference in uh, chronic kidney disease. With that, I will stop and I will take any question. And again, uh, thank you so much for always embracing me and welcoming me to Cairo. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan Ibrahim, for this excellent presentation. Because as we discussed during the Congress, I like your style because your style is discussing some points in polar views. We'll take the opportunity of the presence of the great star of nephrology in Egypt and Arab world, uh, with the gathering from Egypt and Arab world to have uh, Professor Barsoom comments first. Professor Barsoom. I'm not a star, my dear. <laughs> I'm only an old man who is trying to catch up with these excellent uh, presentations that you're uh, doing. Professor Hassan, you have done a great job. I enjoyed every minute of your talk because it just touches very, very normal things that we do without understanding so much the background, the rationale, the reason for doing that. You have provided science for a lot of what we do and enlightened us uh, of what to do and what not to do, particularly the obsessions that we may have about regarding water, salt intake, and so on. It has been remarkably interesting. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, just to start the discussion and pave the way for our colleagues, I just wanted to ask if by soda you mean any soda or only the dark sodas, the Coca-Cola. So if you have a 7-Up, for instance, does it have the same problems uh, like Coca-Cola? The answer is yes. Yes, what? Yes, they are the same. So it, apply, it applies to Mountain Dew, 7-Up, seven okay. everything. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions, gentlemen, ladies? Okay. You, okay. Go ahead. So, uh, carry this, carry yes. On. Yes. I think I think we agree with the uh, the last part, the second part of the presentation. It is uh, all of uh, me and uh, <laughs> I agree with the the view of Professor Hassan Ibrahim. But I think the first part needs further discussion. The, if we start with salt, all guidelines guidelines, Kidigo, Kiduki, the American Heart Association guidelines for preventive medicine in general, uh, restricting salt to normal value. Because if we say salt restriction is no, there is no benefit based on some literatures, the, by this way, we, uh, 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 we have a bias to a certain direction because if we, if we uh, establish this concept, then we'll find people who are consuming a lot of salt. A lot of salt is bad because it is evaluated in accreditation hospitals and it was proven uh, by so cutting salt or restrict restrictions, uh, restriction of sodium will save money, a lot of billion of dollars per year. So I, I, I want Professor Hassan Ibrahim just to discuss, yes, you presented some literatures about salt and myself against uh, severe salt restriction. So yeah, if it is modest salt, okay, please. Yeah, I agree. I think a few things, you know, when I talk about salt restriction, I think, I think moderate salt intake is what we need to do. I think severe restriction, I, I'm convinced it's bad. As to the guidelines, I think you make a really good point, but I think guidelines, uh, are you're talking about things that needs to be implemented for millions and millions of people. So when you, if from a public health perspective, uh, it, it makes sense to say, please take it easy on the salt because it does have economic impact on uh, a lot of things. But I think I kind of separate what the public health, uh, because those are millions and millions of people, and the patient I'm sitting in front of in clinic who, you know, you want him to be on low potassium, low protein, and now you add low salt. So this is how, so I separate the public health, which I think there's probably some benefit to salt moderation 
uh, from the individual patient whose quality of life might be adversely affected by putting them on low salt when the diet when the data is not convincing. But I, I, I agree with uh, with the general sentiment that again I'm not saying go out and buy all the salt you can. I think life is about moderation. So we agree about this point because even in CKD patients, when we have uh, metabolic acidosis or to combat metabolic acidosis, we give sodium bicarbonate. And there is a very nice uh, commentary on the American Journal of Kidney Disease showing that if the patient is treated with sodium bicarbonate, we should cut down salt to very low level of restriction a very low level of sodium intake because if we allow him, allow the patient to, to take the uh, regular sodium, what will happen? Increase the risk of heart failure and hypertension. So the even in CKD, we have a room for a moderate salt restriction, not severe salt restriction, but at least a moderate salt restriction. It is agreed. Even the World Kidney Day this year, one of the key messages is to for the, all the people and the people with CKD is to restrict salt. Yeah, I think, again, I'll just make one more comment. You know, the World Kidney Day has these important recommendations, but I think when, when the WHO and the World Kidney Day kind of make some of these recommendations, I think they're thinking about <clears throat> diseases in a different context than you and I are thinking there's over 200 countries where some people have almost zero access to healthcare, ACE inhibition and ARBs. So uh, recommending a strategy like this makes a lot of sense for, because if it has potential benefit and you could apply it cheaply. So I think they come at it from a different perspective. Uh, I think it's very laudable and it's great, but I think, uh, you know, the fact it's kind of uh, enforced by, by the WHO I think they're dealing with issues way bigger than all of us rather than the individual patient. They're trying to be, and maybe Dr. Shaheen worked with WHO, he could comment. They're, they're worried about the billions and billions of people who have no access to healthcare. And I think that reflects or explains some of their recommendations. That, that trend nowadays for potassium, because I expected that you will supplement the, this presentation by potassium containing diets, because there are accumulating data that potassium is antidote of sodium to the extent that we encourage fruits and vegetables for the sake of potassium contents. And the last and the most updated publications in Kidney International showed in a cohort study well done that sodium restriction had no benefit to polycystic kidney disease, but uh, potassium intake reduces the duration of polycystic kidney disease patients. I, I would like to hear from you about potassium. I said, you know, it's a, it's a challenge uh, to kind of, uh, cause as you know, as, as you know, as GFR declines, it's, it's problematic with the hyperkalemia, but you're right. You point out the recent uh, ADPKD uh, with potassium supplementation. And so it's important because it does seem to reduce blood pressure, et cetera. And I think the bigger uh, issues is that hypokalemia lead to you know, chronic tubular interstitial disease and it, gen, you know, it activates complements not enzymatically and you end up with damage. So I wish there's a way and maybe hopefully maybe people could liberalize their potassium intake now that we have these uh, potassium lowering drugs that uh, have proven safe. But yeah, if there's a way to safely do it, I think it's, it's a terrific approach. But unfortunately, you know, unless if you want to kind of adopt a, a generous potassium uh, intake, you have to make sure that these patients have access to get their potassium measured every two weeks or every month. But if you're going to see them once every six months and put them on high potassium, I worry about that. Uh, I agree with you about this point, especially if the patient is treated with drugs that may elevate serum potassium. This is, these are my comments about sodium and potassium. Let us go uh, rapidly to water drinking. Yes, I, I, I read uh, very carefully CKD with trial. Uh, and the rationale of the trial is to coaching people to drink more water. But the other side is to avoid dehydration. It was not addressed by this study. So it, it, over drinking of water may, no, may be of no benefit, but dehydration is bad, as all of us know, even if there is no randomized controlled trial. So what is uh, uh, 
your comment about this point. Because if we say water is not beneficial, then persons cannot drink water, especially females who are going to work and they don't want to go to the toilet, so they are drinking just one cup or two cup water per day. What is the proper advice from uh, your perspectives? I think they need to drink when they're thirsty. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> the only. I think, and uh, yeah. actually that's the, you know, believe it or not, that's the, the recommendation from the Institute of Medicine. Uh, just drink when you're thirsty. Certainly, you know, as people get older, I think thirst mechanisms are altered or dampened. You need to remind them to drink. But if you drink when you're thirsty, I think you'll be fine. I have a lot of points, but I, I should stop here. The my, One question is, uh, what about Nescafe? If, uh, I think you clarified this point. It is roasted or light coffee, and this is only the, the beneficial one. Is Nescafe beneficial or is bad? You know what? I don't. I actually have to. I have to learn more about Nescafe. What actually? How darkly roasted it is? I have to say I don't know enough about it, uh, so I don't know the answer. Okay, uh, I'd like Dr. Mohammed Al Hadidi, who is uh, the uh, technical supporter uh, and my friend, is to to just read the question in the chat before uh, having the comment of the of my professors and colleagues, Dr. Mohammed Al Hadidi. Uh, okay, Dr. Mohammed Saeed has uh, two questions. Is yes. there any effect of the green tea on the kidney? This is the first question. And the second question, what about water pollution? What about the bad effect of water pollution on the kidney? Well, the only, uh, the only thing I know about green tea is uh, from the Singapore Health Study. And it didn't at least it was not associated with better GFR or less ESRD compared to black tea uh, or other beverages with similar caffeine content. That's the only data I know specific to kidney disease. As uh, water pollution, I think uh, this is really an important question and I kind of considered talking about that because, you know, I think you know, Dr. Barsoom, I think, done a lot of stuff on interstitial disease. I mean, you think about the cadmium and the lead and the mercury and all the stuff that's in the water that certainly has been associated with tubular interstitial disease. So I think it plays a part, uh, but uh, I, don't, I didn't find a lot of data on it uh, unless it's associated with uh, trace metal or heavy metal pollution. Professor Barsoom? Please. Yes, we did some studies on uh, water pollution with lead and with cadmium, and both of them uh, were associated with a higher incidence of uh, interstitial disease, particularly in uh, in areas of factories and uh, uh, and uh, uh, areas that are more exposed to to lead and cadmium, battery factories, fish factories, and so on. So yes, we did that. Okay, Dr. Hadidi. Muhammad. Muhammad. Okay, Hadidi. we have one. We have we have one last comment from uh, Dr. Muhammad Saeed. Um, uh, he's saying that uh, salt restriction might be beneficial on the short and intermediate term on the CKD patient, but on the long term, the effect is questionable. Okay, let us uh, uh, by bath salt and uh, there, uh, no, there I, is any. I, <laughs> I agree with his compliment completely. Oh, yeah, yeah. We we okay. know we know you know it may reduce blood pressure, maybe reduce pro in the intermediate outcome. But do we have evidence that it prevents uh, end stage kidney disease? The answer is no. It doesn't make it not true. We just don't have the evidence. I mean, uh, so I agree with that comment. But excuse me, Professor O'Brien, because the the problem to prove is to have randomized control trial, and I think it is very difficult among. Uh, the multitude of confounders that to do randomized clinical trials and the, the disease is progressing. So I think sometimes we are faced with uh, brashot studies uh, or something like that. So, some, so, so this is why we, if we have cohort study, as you mentioned, and cohort is good among a large number of patients done in uh, uh, highly qualified centers, and I think we, we respect cohort studies in these domains. Yeah, and we have that, you know, the Crick study is, has the data, nobody's ever looked at it, and I'm not sure why, but we should be able to do it. Uh, that'd be easy, easy done, because they have 24-hour urines, and it's a cohort of 3,000 patients. It's been in existence for 15 years. 
you know, they have the APOL1 stuff, so you could kind of measure confounders. So I think it needs to be done. But yeah, nobody's going to do a randomized trial. I mean, yeah. you know, there's no money in it for anyone. You know, I mean, salt industry wants you to eat more salt. I mean, who's going to pay for, you know, the government is not going to pay for it. So nobody's interested in doing these things. When I say we need a randomized trial, I just think I'm trying to emphasize that observational data is just that. They're observation. You just look at them, you know, yes. it doesn't, uh, I mean, that's the point I'm trying to emphasize, but uh, I fully realize a lot of the stuff we want randomized trials on, it will never happen. Nobody's going to pay for it because nobody's going to make money off of it. Okay. Dr. Hadidi? Uh, the last question? question on the, the last question on the chat uh, from Dr. Ahmed Abdul Jalil, he's asking about uh, uh, Professor uh, Ibrahim opinion in Acacia gum. I don't know if I pro pronounce it right, Akizia gum, and does it have any beneficial regarding CKD progression? I have no idea. Dr. Barsoom might know. I, Akizia gum. We are, we are aware a, only of the Arabic gum uh, that is used in Sudan. Uh, we, we have done some studies on that. It, it is a phosphate binder and uh, is also a potassium binder. Uh, and indirectly, it reduces the blood urea because obviously of binding as well, but no effect on progression, no effect on blood pressure. So I don't think it is, it can be counted as a medicine in CKD. And there is a very nice case report in the Kidney International, as I, I, as I remember. Uh, Arabic gum is including calcium and enhanced calcium reabsorption from the gut, so the, we should be careful and to monitor calcium because it may be associated with acute kidney injury on top of chronic kidney disease. And the problem, even if we have Arabic gum from, his, from its sources, original sources, even in Sudan, for example, there are many types of Arabic gums. So, uh, and the, the dogma that some um, uh, lay people uh, uh, told the patient that it is safe to have Arabic gum. The, the patients can stop all medications uh, for the sake of that Arab, Arabic gum will do everything. And I think it is harmful so long as it is not well observed. This is to take it very carefully. Uh, there is a, uh, any, any question, Mohammed, or this is all the yeah, questions? Yes, we have, we, have one, we have one more question. It's from Dr. Yes. Ahmed Aizat. He's asking about how much salt or water should we advise for CKD patients and how are they calculated? Well, what, what I tell them, uh, uh, honestly, the, I, I said, you should eat whatever is healthy for your heart is healthy for your kidney. Uh, and I think all of us know what, what a healthy diet is. And as a fluid intake, I just say, you know, uh, drink when you're thirsty. And my preference for you drink is, you know, water or light ro roasted uh, coffee uh, and no soda as much as possible. That's what I tell them. And I kind of just kind of round numbers. I made up these numbers, you know, it's like less than two liters. You know, I'm, I'm happy with anything less than 150 milli equivalents of sodium a day. Uh, anywhere between 100 to 150, I'm very happy with it unless they're multi-drug hypertension where there's an opportunity to lower their sodium intake. If lower sodium intake leads you to taking less medications and the patient tolerates it, I'm all for it. You know, if it saves you. So again, it's very helpful adjunct in many people, uh, but not in everyone. So less than two liters a day, 100, 150 uh, millimoles of sodium uh, are kind of general guidelines that I use. I think one of the advantages of uh, these informations that we have some people who are thinking that water is magic. And we have uh, some of my colleagues, who uh, one of them is professor uh, in cardiology, for example, and he is drinking a gallon of water every day and he is carrying gallons of water in his car to the extent that, and he is anxious if syrup creatine increase from one to one point one. So, and some patients have severe hyponatremia because of excessive water drinking. So I think the modest way is the best way to deal with the human being. Uh, do you agree about this point, Dr. Ibrahim? I, I agree completely. I think, 
I think, you know, somebody told me this a long time ago, said there's probably be, there were more deaths from hyponatremia than dehydration from, you know, overzealous water use. Okay. Uh, we'll start from uh, the, uh, some comments from the attendees because we have today gathering from professors and the colleagues from Arab world. So we'll start with uh, Professor Saeed Khamis. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Professor yes. Baim, for this. You hear me, Dr. Hussein? Yes, you, I hear you well. Go ahead, yeah, please. Yes. Thanks for you all. Thanks, Professor Ibrahim, for this elegant presentation. Just I have two short questions. Number one, what about this still debatable uh, issue about the red meat on the kidney health? Uh, second, what are the sources of the hidden salt? Or another meaning, I mean hidden uh, sodium in the form of medication, the food, the beverage, and so on. Thank you so much. Great question. I'll start with that with the latter question. So where where's the majority of our salt come from? Believe it or not, is is bread. If you the re if you if you if you want to do this or you know try to make bread without salt, it will never happen. It cannot take form, you cannot shape it. So the majority of salt comes from bread. That's one. And in fact, you know, one of the biggest lobbyists against uh, salt restriction in the U.S. is the bread making industry. Because if you take away salt from them, they can't they can make bread. Second is processed food. Anything that you have to open with a jar opener or can opener, uh, you know, those are processed food. So fresh food, fresh vegetables, uh, et cetera, they're the lowest sodium. So again, canned food and bread in my mind are the biggest. Now, the issue of red meat, I think, uh, and maybe Dr. Barsoom could also comment on this. You know, you know, you have to think about it in three contexts. One, does really, does protein restriction help? Uh, and I'm convinced it has no place in slowing the progression of kidney disease. So the question is, if protein restriction doesn't help, what is the best source of protein? Is it red meat versus plant meat? And I think there's been multiple, multiple studies that showed kind of more favorable renal profile with plant-based proteins in terms of uh, GFR preservation and proteinuria. So I certainly favor plant-based proteins and I'm not a big advocate for protein restriction. Uh, Dr. Barsoom, what are your thoughts on protein? I completely concur that it does not affect the progression of kidney disease in humans at least. Uh, perhaps there are some rat experiments that show some progression, focus sclerosis, but uh, maybe not in humans. However, uh, animal protein, as you just mentioned, uh, carries along uh, a lot of potassium, a lot of phosphate, a lot of uric acid, uh, in addition to the protein. So probably some of the injury that happens with too much animal protein uh, is related to the complexity of the animal protein. There's also the issue of uh, biological value of the protein. For instance, when you eat uh, 100 grams of meat, you actually use about 60 and the rest it goes to the liver to form urea. So many people by a, high, by a high protein diet would feel a bad taste in their mouth, which is the ammonia resulting from urea degradation and so on. So probably meat also uh, can close the appetite of the patient uh, by generating too much urea. Of course, high biological value proteins like milk or eggs uh, is preferable if you want to have a good protein intake. Uh, but meat is not really a very good choice. Yeah, and I, I think I would add to that, you know, with, you know, when, once you get to 100 grams per day, that means you're generating 100 mill equivalents of acid too. Exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, with each gram protein, you're generating one mill equivalent of it, which as you yeah. know, we're learning, it probably accelerates progression of kidney disease. Yes, but that doesn't mean that we, we don't allow protein, uh, animal protein. Actually, it's needed for the essential amino acids and so on. Uh, yet the moderation in a, a small amount is important. And I also, I also noticed that some of our colleagues advise the patients to have meat every other day or twice a week. And this really irritates me because metabolism continues all weekdays. So if you're going to allow some animal protein, you can allow small dose every day rather than once a week or twice a week. What do you expect the body to do on, on those days when you eat protein compared to those when you don't eat protein? 
And, and if you allow me just a comment about the bread, because when I attended one of the era editor conferences held in Turkey, I think seven years or more than seven years, um, uh, when I, I went to, to buy some sandwich, the bread, only on the bread, but they wrote the contents of salt in the bread. With the bread, without any foods, without any meat, without anything, it is 15 gram. <laughs> so it is a huge amount. And in the leaflet of the, con the Congress, they are stressing about five gram per day, sodium. So in one bread, without added uh, uh, cheese or meat, it is 15 gram. So to be careful about bread. Uh, Dr. Faisal Shaheen. Thanks. Thank you, Hussein. Ibrahim, as usual, I enjoy your talk. It's excellent and uh, to, to the point, and uh, I like it very much, actually. Thank but you. two things which I, I wanted to, to share with you is about Arabic coffee, which we have. Uh, Arabic coffee, uh, it is uh, something which is a coffee without uh, boiling it, without doing any, uh, you know, de without removing the antioxidant from the, the Arabic coffee, which maybe it, it's a little bit get benefit to, to progression of CKD or, or maybe it is better than the Arabic, the other coffee, because uh, I, I did some research long time back about different kind of coffee and I found that Arabic coffee is the most pure and it, it contained the caffeine and whatever it had plus antioxidant and uh, probably this things which can a little bit help uh, to uh, against the progression of CKD. The other point about the salt again, I'm sorry to open this discussion again, Hassan. This is because, okay, go ahead, yeah, because I, I remember the professor read a long time back, he was talking about uh, hypertension with the salt intake. And uh, in, in one of the Scandinavian country, they could manage to decrease the hypertension in that in the older populations by even 25 percent after reduction of gradually of the salt intake in that country i think one maybe norwegian or some one of those countries uh, so indirect we can have hypertension hypertension can lead to ckd which uh, again uh, some something with restriction probably of salt especially with a cardiac patient, with CKD patient, is, is necessary and important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Riyad Saeed. Mr. Khair. Dr. Hassan, shukran jazeel ala al-muhadra al-qayyima. Ustadna Dr. Rashad, ana sa'id jiddan bisama' sultak. Alam ya riyad. Allah yikhalik. Two questions, in fact. Now, concerning the coffee, now we know that the, the caffeine part of it, what's its effect really on the blood pressure that may offset really the other part of the, caf of the coffee, which is the chlorogenic acid? Is there is any interplay between these two components, Dr. Hassan? I says, you know, I, I, uh, oh, well, she, uh, nice to hear your voice, sir. Ahlan, ahlan, ahlan. <laughs> I think, you know, I was, I was actually, Professor, quite surprised the impact on blood, actually, that there's so little data to suggest that caffeine raises blood pressure. I, I, was, I was amazingly surprised by actually how weak that evidence is. Moreover, I think it's the methylxanthine part of the caffeine kind of gives you a little bit of diuresis that I think if anything, it actually may, may help with blood pressure. But I really couldn't find any evidence that it actually raises blood pressure. Uh, and I actually took it to the other extreme, which is these uh, highly caffeinated energy drinks where they have like 30 and 50 grams of, uh, of uh, caffeine. And there's, there hasn't been, I mean, they're dangerous for your heart, but they don't seem to raise blood pressure. So I don't think uh, hypertension, at least from my reading, uh, it has any, caffeine has no impact on blood pressure uh, to any appreciable degree. Okay. The second part, really, again, back to the salt, if you allow me. You know, we are talking about salt and salt. You know, most of our patients, really, they are seen by cardiologists also. And I'd like to warn that instead of taking the regular salt, they advise them to take salt substitute, which is really the what we call it, 
Basically, this is potassium chloride. It is potassium chloride salt. Not only that, nowadays we have available, at least in our country here in Jordan, what they call el malh al khafif light salt, which is a combination between sodium chloride and potassium chloride. So really, you know, we have to be careful about what we prescribe for patients, uh, tell them to restrict a little bit their salt, but they are compensating it with potassium salt. Uh, are you aware of this uh, information, yeah. Dr. Hassan? Uh, Dr. Riyad, I'm, I'm certainly aware of all these life-threatening hyperkalemia reported yes. in the literature from potassium salts, and you just raised and uh, and I think that I think the way I kind of view your comment is how extremely important it is that we take the time to know what the what people are taking. Because, you know, we're always rushed, you know, we're in between patients. We just want to know what medications they're taking. But in reality, the other stuff that they're taking, and they just don't even volunteer to tell us. So I think your, your point is so right on. And I think that should be part of the routine question. You know, what's your blood pressure? What's your sugar doing? How many sodas? How many coffees? How much water? And add, you know, are you using salt substitute? I think that really should become... Uh, it's such an important point because hyperkalemia obviously is not a trivial problem. Thank you. But Dr. Riyad, let me, Dr. Riyad yeah. let me ask you a question. Were, yes. uh, is it your impression that caffeine raises blood pressure? I'm, I'm, well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Just I'm asking, you know, uh, because you hear here and there, there is no solid data, as you mentioned. But, you know, I throw this question just for you because you, I'm sure you did a lot of work concerning this. And again, to our real uh, uh, colleague, Dr. Barsoom, what he thinks about this. <laughs> no, I am not convinced that caffeine raises blood pressure. I think there is an overlap with two things. A, caffeine may inhibit sleep. So the patient becomes a little bit tense and maybe that raises the blood pressure. And two, Many people would feel a headache, so they take coffee because they think this is uh, a sort of a coffee withdrawal headache, and in fact, that would be an expression of hypertension per se. So I think there is an overlap, and I'm not convinced. I don't prevent my patients from taking any coffee when they're hypertensive. What about increasing the heart rate? It does. It does. When it does, I tell them to take less. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> but if, if you allow me here for, for just for two points, uh, if we advise for coffee, we should be careful in polycystic kidney disease because coffee is not welcomed at all in polycystic kidney disease because it may be incriminated in cystogenesis and the progression of cyst. The second point, in, in salt substitute, we should be careful about chloride. Chloride is bad, anion. And it, it, because there is a very nice uh, report in American Journal of Kidney Disease about sodium bicarb and sodium chloride, which anion is bad. And after the analysis, the, so the answer was chloride is more bad than bicarb within sodium. Do you want to comment on this, Professor Ibrahim? Uh, well, I think, you know, you, you always like uh, make comments that will take hours to respond to, but I'll try. <laughs> Uh, but certainly, you know, the chloride issue is kind of emerged over the last, you know, uh, few years, you know, how bad it is for you. And, you know, you, I'm sure everyone followed, you know, do you give sodium chloride or, you know, chloride based? Uh, uh, you know, I never got on that bandwagon that chloride is really bad for you. But uh, I, I know the literature. And uh, again, I. I don't think the evidence is compelling one way or another, but, uh, but I, I know where you're coming from and I don't know if others, <laughs> okay. if others want to, Dr. Barsoom, I know are you are a chloride lover or chloride hater. You could tell us. <laughs> I am. I'm neutral. But I, <laughs> I recently read a paper. I don't really remember which reference was. The question was whether the bicarbonate, the anion associated with sodium makes any difference. And it was comparing sodium bicarbonate to sodium chloride. Conclusion was no difference. It's the sodium that matters uh, concerning the blood pressure, of course, uh, the target of blood pressure. Now, I completely oh. concur with you, Professor Ibrahim, uh, that uh, sodium may have to be restricted for the sake of blood pressure and volume expansion, particularly in patients with heart disease. But when it comes to the pure effect on the kidney, I really think the kidney loves a little salt. Uh, the kidney doesn't know how to preserve salt when you have a stage three kidney disease. So the patient actually is losing some salt 
And unless you replace it, he becomes uh, more and more toxic, and you go into that vicious circle of malnutrition and so on. So my advice to my patients is, take a little sodium to make the food palatable. And that is your measure, that's all. I, ha I have to say, this is one of the most thoughtful thing you've always, everything you say is thoughtful, but this is one of the most, I mean, as your GFR gets to 15 and 25 and 35, you don't have much room. I mean, you could go into volume depletion in one second and a, a five extra millimoles it could push you to volume expansion. So that's why the issue of restriction, I mean, you don't have a nephron that's able of, you know, typical reabsorptive mechanism. And this is so important. People, I think we need to emphasize the limited uh, kind of reabsorptive win window that the kidney could handle even narrow fluctuation in sodium and water intake. So thank you so much. This is just uh, so thoughtful. But at the end of the day, we, we advise for some restriction, especially oh, yeah. for patients treated with ACE inhibitors, because salt is uh, making ACE inhibitor doesn't work well. I think so. I, I, I disagree with that. I think salt would, would suppress your renin and angiotensin system. And th this is what's funny about this area. You know, if I restrict your salt, your renin and aldo are going to go up. So you can't have your cake and eat it, right? You know, you have, so I, I, I disagree with, with that. I think, you know, <laughs> moderate, I mean, severe restriction is going to jack up your renin and aldo. I mean, there's no way around it. And, you know, I know what people say. It was like, oh, well, if, you, if you're on low salt, you diuretic, you provide more substrate to the ACE inhibitor, it works better. That's never been shown to be true. So, again, I know we're arguing. I think you and I have a difference maybe of 20 milli equivalent today. We're not, we're, we're not arguing about 100. <laughs> okay. Just, just 20. Okay. Professor Amr Hussain. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hassan Ibrahim. We are all learn, I think, from your initial publication in New England Journal of Medicine about long-term outcome of uh, kidney donation. And I like your approach because uh, I think you left us with more uncertainties, skepticism, and um, more doubt about things that we used to do for years. I think as Albert Einstein said, the problem with this world is uh, knowledgeable people are full of uncertainties and ignorant people are full of confidence. And the problem is, I think, the crowd and uh, you know, the whole universe are sometimes biased and go uh, with the flow and follow the confident people rather than the knowledgeable scientist uh, people uh, with some doubt. Um, so I like your approach, I agree. And we ha I think we have to agree to disagree. I know that uh, Dr. Hassan has different opinion with the soul. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I like- I am always ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say it. But, but I, I think because you go against the flow, or at least you don't go with the flow, I think um, this is very uh, good approach. Other thing is I like this talks because, um, you know, I never, I didn't hear any single word about any medications here. Uh, so the non-pharmacological approach is very, very important. And sometimes because of the bias of the pharmaceutical companies, we just, uh, you know, get spoiled with the easy thing that is available in the market and give prescription rather than to go with the hard approach and to talk about you know natural thing, uh, food and drink, and um, other natural approach, non pharmacological approach. So I think that's very important because as physician we have to focus not only on the medicine uh, or the pharmacological approach, but more importantly about the non pharmacological approach. The last thing uh, I would like to hear your opinion about uh, other non-pharmacological intervention, which is the exercise. What do you think the impact of exercise on uh, the progression of uh, kidney disease? And what I'm asking here 
is about the not the acute impact of exercise with dehydration or you know whatever and hyponatremia or electrolyte disturbance, but the long term impact of exercise on kidney function. Thank you for all these uh, uh, thoughtful comments. I think the exercise is really another important area. Uh, I think certainly it has uh, kind of functions in one of two ways. One, uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in, in chronic kidney disease, and certainly physical fitness could lessen that, and hopefully we will see positive impact on chronic kidney disease. Now, more specific to chronic kidney disease, does exercise make a difference? And there hasn't been a lot on aerobic activity uh, and impact on progression. There is some, and it tends to be positive. But what has been done in a more uh, kind of uh, scientific way is resistance training. Uh, so resistance training versus no resistance training, which means you know, weightlifting, isometric exercises. And there's actually one of these papers is, was in the Annals of Term Medicine from a few years ago. And it does appear that resistance training is associated with a favorable impact uh, on lowering blood pressure. And possibly in one study that was, I think it was two and a half, maybe three years long, it actually improved uh, GFR uh, change over time. So I do think the benefit, the cardiac benefit will translate into kidney benefit. But what I tell my patient is uh, as much as possible to do resistance training. Uh, unfortunately, I think, you know, this is one thing I'd like to see go away, you know, the, how often beta blockers are used in chronic kidney disease, which limits exercise tolerance, certainly if you need it for cardiac indication. But I have to say, I think beta blockers have been uh, I think somewhat unhelpful in terms of making people tired, reducing their cardio, their exercise tolerance. So the short answer, the more active they are, the better they are. In terms of definitive scientific evidence, most of it favors uh, resistance training uh, as a potential uh, renal protective strategy. I don't know if others know other data. Dr. Barsoon, are you aware of any other data? No data, but I agree that uh encouraging exercise not only improves the physical fitness of the patient, but also uh, improves muscle uptake of protein. So when you give the patient a certain amount of protein and he exercises, uh, the protein goes to the muscle rather than going to the liver and get broken down into uh, toxic substances. So I encourage gentle exercise, but I have no clinical, uh, I mean, scientific data for that. Prof. Amr Hosseini is, uh, is working in Kentucky in the Metabolic Bone Disease Center, and uh, he delivered a very elegant presentation with us a couple of weeks ago about exercise and bone. And he shows elegantly through his presentation that uh, uh, exercise improves bone. So, uh, Professor Amr, would you like to, to add a statement here on exercise and bone? In... Uh, thank you for your comment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, let us just stick here to the kidneys <laughs> on, uh, and uh, you know maybe just a little comment also is and it, it might coincide with uh, whatever we are doing about also is exercise even in in the bone and the metabolic uh, bone disease. Uh, you know there is uh, just very small, very few studies uh, you know that uh, investigated this stuff. Again, we are. We have a problem here because who is going to sponsor a study, as Dr. Ibrahim said, uh, about impact of exercise? They can, you know, invest billions of dollars on a medicine, you know, but they are not going to invest one dollar to, um, you know, study the impact of some natural thing. So really, we are, I think, a uh, little bit contaminated, and this is another talk by the pharmaceutical industry because it, uh, you know, the major funding agencies and the major you know, uh, money comes from the pharmaceutical companies. But yeah, there is some evidence in bone disease, but it's not huge evidence, it's just a small study. Uh, again, also when it comes to all these natural and non-pharmacological interventions, the evidence is based you know, more on retrospective uh, studies 
So it's not, you cannot say even with the salt, I think uh, the take off point that there is no causation. I mean, these studies are mostly retrospective studies. So, uh, and there is, you know, several covariates to lay in that. So I think it's too hard to say that if you are taking less salt, uh, your kidney will be better or will be worse because it's all association, you know, not acquisition studies. Thank you very much, Professor Amr, for all these points. I'd, I'd like to, I'd yes. just like to add one comment on the bone health too. I think you know I think it's obvious we end up using a lot of loop diuretics to to control hypertension, and I think I find myself over the years getting really more and more worried about bone health and chronic kidney disease because we carry in our head this general idea that hydrochlorothiazide loses effectiveness, you know, below a GFR of 35, which you know, is I could understand why we think that, which, you know, there are ongoing trials to actually show it's comparable in chronic kidney disease to lube diuretics. But I think our, our uh, generous use of lube diuretics may be contributing to some of the bone uh, health issues we're seeing. Prof. Amr, I'd like, like to add that. that. And even lube diuretic is not the first choice uh, when it comes to the blood pressure management. Uh, especially in CKD patient, but uh, you know the uh, hydro hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothalidone is uh, a first choice, and it's also good for from the CKD MBD perspective. Thank you very much, Professor Amr. I uh, I remember the couple of observational studies about exercise and the CKD progression, and exercise was was shown uh, to be effective in reducing progression of CKD. And another study in, on stone exercise also is uh, reducing stone formation, urine stone formation. So there are a lot of observational data uh, confirming the advantage of exercise, even in the health patients. Nowadays, uh, we encourage them to be ambulant, to be actively uh, walking uh, or even laughing <laughs> to do uh, even any mode of exercise. This is a very good to these patients. Uh, Dr. Yassid Idris. Thank you for the uh, answer. Okay. Thank you Elegant, for this lecture. I just want to have a comment about the uh, Arabic gum. Yes. Uh, two, years ago, uh, two years ago in Sudan, we begin uh, research about use of the Arabic gum. It is a multi-center uh, trial, five uh, renal centers in Sudan with sharing of authors and researches from UK and, and Belgium. Uh, uh, we study uh, 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 slow progression of the use of the uh, Arabic gum in slow progression of CKD, and in blood pressure, and even in, electro in electrolytes. We observe that in patients, we selected patients with CKD stage three, and use about 25 gram of Arabic gum from uh, a famous tree, which is called Hashab. Sharp trees, which is a common uh, common product of tree of uh, Arabic gum. So, which is observed is that uh, in patients who use the Arabic gum, the slow regression of CKD, and even normalize of their blood pressure. Even some patients they leave their medication in use. I think this uh, research will, will it is uh, will give a, a good result in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Yasser. But uh, again, regarding the Arabic gum or herbal remedies, I am very skeptical because of adulteration and, uh, and uh, bad preparation uh, because we, we need to know the source. So, and this is a real problem with Arabic gum and the other herbal remedies uh, from my mind. Dr. Amr, do you like to add anything here? here? Yes. Dr. Yasser, okay. No, no, I don't, uh, uh, but I really, uh, I don't know if there is a good study. I mean, yeah, I see that and I get question of this Arabic gum and the remedies all the time from patients uh, who live in the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, but I doubt that we have a good uh, evidence with uh, well-designed randomized control studies on that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Faisal, do you like to add thing? For that, oh, okay. I don't okay. know why I'm 
Okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, for the Arabic gum, we have so many patients are using this. Uh, really, and we, we, we suffer from the complication which they got. Uh, probably the source is not the right one. Uh, we know that it is the Arabic gum will reduce the, the urea uh, through small intestine and with the bulky stool, it will take out a lot of uh, uh, content of uh, some mineral, but uh, this is known, uh, but still, and it would decrease the, the urea and also the creatinine to a special, to, to a limit, but because again, the patient will have a lot of distension and he will not able to eat. So if you prevent someone eating anything, his urea and creatine will come down, but it never takes someone out of dialysis, uh, probably a temporary for one or two weeks, three weeks, but he will return back symptomatic, actually uremia, uh, which uh, we, we are facing. We have such one. I know that there are some studies in Sudan, uh, probably not the same like what I said, but we published even data from Sudan to show that it is not permanent treatment, it is just temporary and the effect is temporary, not a long one. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Faisal. Professor Maya Hasaballah. We have five minutes and we'll stop Dr. Hassan because I know it is two hours now. Dr. May. Collaborative uh, talk. And you always seem to be going against, going objectively, I mean, against many um, firm beliefs that we have. So I like your different approach and really learn a lot from these discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Salah Sharaw, shukran, Dr. May. Dr. Salah Sharaw, Salah Din. Yes. Unmute yourself and uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Hassan and uh, Professor Barashab uh, Barsoom for this elegant uh, lectures and uh, uh, new uh, prospect of uh, seeing the things in uh, our area. But in GCC countries, as you know, uh, patients are not controlling their uh, foods and they, most of them having hyperkalemia. And uh, uh, the recommendation for treatment is starting with ACE ARBs, which lead to the hyperkalemia as well. So uh, what is the best approach for diet control in patients to control their sodium and potassium and uh, with, without uh, having a problem with the green vegetables and green leaves? So what left for them to live on it? It is a very, uh, very, very difficult question when a patient asks you, uh, what should I eat after that? If you are restricting the green uh, leaf and uh, dates and uh, carbohydrates because of I am diabetic as well. So what's left for them? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Salah. Dr. Hassan? Yeah, you, you raise uh, such an important, important uh, point. And I think I finally, I think I feel like I have an answer to half of the people, which is I think with diabetic kidney disease now, we have something that has never been this revolutionary in management of diabetic kidney disease, which is SGL2 inhibitors where you could lower blood pressure, improve glycemic control, lower proteinuria, reduce cardiac death, reduce uric acid, you name it. These drugs are absolutely, I think, are amazing. And patients who don't tolerate ACEs and ARBs uh, should, I mean, I think all of everyone should be on these drugs unless they have a contraindication. So I think for half of the population, the diabetics, I think these drugs, I feel like they, they will offer if we use them well, use them early enough, they're going to offer people an opportunity and preserving kidney function without the need to restrict their dietary intake because of hyperkalemia. So I think I'd like to emphasize how we need to really be using more of these. The second issue, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of potassium lowering drugs now that are available. Hopefully they're available in the Middle East that we could use. Uh, but nothing substitutes for the patient education and their family's education, because a lot of time the patient families, the mom or the wife doesn't even, is not at the visit. They don't even know what they should cook or not cook. So I think involvement in the family, but you raise, I mean, we're asking them eat less of this, less of this, less of this, less of this. And when we see their albumin of 2.5, 
was like, oh, malnutrition is common in kidney disease. Well, we're responsible for some of this. So uh, your point is well taken. And I think we need to think about ways to optimize nutrition uh, with more liberal diets, but not at the expense of expensive hyperkalemia. And I think SGL2 inhibitors are offering us an opportunity, I feel, that we need to, to take advantage of. Since a couple of years, I changed my mind regarding potassium containing fruits and vegetables to the extent that I advocate all general population toward using a sufficient amount of fruits and vegetables. And for early stages of CKD, to have sufficient amount of fruits and vegetables. And to be careful in patients who are treated with this inhibitor or uh, uh, potassium sparing diuretics, just to monitor. And there are many methods to be uh, used after the educating uh, patients and family how to uh, take potassium uh, in a wise way by uh, 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 avoiding the, uh, the, so, uh, the some types of uh, fruits and from those uh, 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 that are famous with hyperkalemia and using the majority of uh, fruits. So the earlier stage of CKD, I think earlier stage of CKD, the patient can get rid of potassium, no problem, and there is no real risk of hyperkalemia. But if the patient on drugs, as, you, as Professor Ibrahim mentioned, to monitor potassium. Let the last comment to Dr. Mariam. Dr. Mariam, please unmute yourself if you'd like to add anything. Mariam? Okay. So uh, um, before I'm leaving the mic to Professor Barsoom to conclude the session, I would like to. Dr. Uh, yes. uh, Mariam, okay. go ahead in English. English. <laughs> in English. Okay, this, this is my daughter's account actually in Zoom. Because okay. I don't have an account okay. in Zoom. So. I usually take my, my daughter's name. Uh, well, okay. thank you so much for the nice lecture and presentation. But uh, with a lot of um, confusion now about the salt and fruits and potassium and diet, we need a summary for what we have been talking about the last two hours, if possible. And I'll not comment about the polycystic kidney disease and water intake, because we had notions before increased water intake, reduce the cystic progression in patients with adult polycystic kidney. So I need comment about that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bahat. Well, you're asking me to summarize everything, so I'll do it. <laughs> it is difficult. Uh, so certainly the, your last point, I think we emphasize that uh, generous water intake is probably the right thing to do in the setting of polycystic kidney disease and also patients with kidney stones. Uh, I think, I think that, I mean, I think we all on the call agree that too much salt is probably not good for you. And very little salt, less than 100 milli equivalent is not good for the majority of people. So being moderate, you could salt your food, but no added salt. That's kind of what I tell patients. I think that's probably uh, the reasonable thing to do. On a large health, public health policy, I think uh, less salt is probably beneficial because of the you know, reduction in strokes, et cetera, when you, you're dealing with millions. At the individual patient level, I think if salt restrictions offers you an advantage to reduce need for blood pressure medications, I think that's wonderful because that's less medication, less cost, less side effects. But can you tell a patient that if I put you on less salt, you're less likely to develop kidney failure? The answer is no, because we don't have that information. So I think a, a diet that's healthy for your heart, that's moderate in salt, moderate in high quality protein, no need for extra water or fluid beyond two liters, avoiding diet soda, uh, coffee is, is probably good, especially if it's light roasted. Other caffeinated beverages do not seem to be harmful or beneficial. Uh, I think engaging the patient in kind of knowing all this uh, rather than emphasizing pharmacological stuff, I think this is what will get us somewhere. Hopefully I answered some of the confusion, but this is kind of how I approach it. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure everybody has a different unique po patient population, but this is kind of how I uh, approach it. Okay. Uh, before I'm leaving the mic to Professor Barsoom to conclude the session, I would like to thank Professor Hassan Ibrahim very much. You enlightened us, and this is a real lesson in critical appraisal. Don't, uh, we learned today 
not 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 to take a dogma. We should think and we should um, ask where the evidence. And uh, it is uh, a very brainstorming presentation. This is and uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, a symbol just of appreciation of SNT and SNT CMA chapter for Professor Hassan Ibrahim. We appreciate uh, your presence. You, we appreciate your talk and uh, your chair for the discussion. This is a very wonderful presentation, and I like it very much. And uh, when I take uh, any other opinion, I just uh, want to create discussion because I enjoy to hear uh, to Professor Hassan Ibrahim. And uh, today, uh, thank you very much. And today, it is also, as I said in the, in the first uh, part, in the introduction, it is amazing to have uh, ligand in the field of nephrology, Professor Bersoum. He is a role model. Uh, he is a gr not greatest star, he is the greatest star I have ever known in the field of nephrology in Egypt, Arab world, and in the world in the field of nephrology. So I'm um, leaving now the mic to Professor Barsoom to say the final speech. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Hussein. I am embarrassed by the kind words that you are saying about me. It's nice to hear this from your younger brother when you are that old as I am. So uh, I thank you very much. And I also thank Professor Hassan so much. You have added even more assets <clears throat> to your uh, contributions to Egyptian nephrology. You have been with us several times, and every time you learn even more. Uh, this time you have been remarkably practical. Uh, you touched very, very common issues in a very scientific way. You looked for the evidence. And you passed to me, at least, the important me message uh, of the essentiality of individualizing the approach to individual patients. And that's what is in the guidelines. Addressing thousands and millions of patients does not necessarily apply to individual patients. We should remain as wise physicians looking into the problems of each patient per se and design the treatment in addition to designing the diet, seeing his or her normal habits, and how are we going to modify them in a way that doesn't injure, the, injure their kidneys without going behind dogmas that are not proven. You've been most remarkable, Professor Hassan, thank you very much. On behalf of all of us and uh, of myself, uh, thank you and keep well. Well, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Sum. It's always a pleasure to be in your company, even if it's virtual. I feel honored to be in your company and Dr. Shaheen and uh, all of you. Thank you so much for being part of the Egyptian family, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank, thank you, you very much, Professor Hassan. And this is the, the invitation from the Egyptian Society of Nephrology Continuous Medical Education. And we have Professor Maya Hassabullah. Uh, she is the president elect of the society. And this is an invitation for you. Whenever you f find uh, you, uh, a time in your agenda, we will be very delighted to, and happy to hear from you uh, the concept. So this is an invitation because really you enriched uh, our mind. And I, I think when the video will be uploaded tomorrow, the, uh, those who cannot attend this meeting will take the benefit from hearing your thoughts and the uh, discussion within this meeting. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank all my professors and colleagues, uh, especially professors from Arab world and U United States, UK. We have a lot of, uh, we have today a very prestigious gathering from, from all over the world. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you for participations and um, uh, uh, goodbye. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, it's time to goodbye. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Torfesa, thank you. Uh, thank you.